welcome back to my channel again I'm really glad that you're back here and this is so exciting today I am going to be filming a video about my PGC experience and also not even just specific to my PGC experience but a general what to expect from the PGC. I am so glad that I have finally finished my PGC. I have been waiting for this moment for so long and I am enjoying every single day of these summer holidays. Every day I wake up, I just think, yay, I have finished my PGC. I am so, so relieved that the PGC is complete. The most overwhelming feeling that I felt during my PGCA was that I didn't really know how it all worked, like a few different areas of how it worked, for example, like the grading, the placements, the uni days, the placement days, the mentor, subject mentor, professional mentor, uni mentor, the whole year I never really understood the process until it came to the end and it kind of all got tied up is that the word I say it now obviously I finally understood how it all worked before I started I did look for videos about the PGCE experience because online it does have information but it's never really that in depth and I don't feel like the information that the university provides is realistic sometimes like you know so I just thought if I was in that position where I wanted a video about the PGCA then perhaps other people might be in the same position that I was in this time last year and therefore this video would be helpful for them and also anybody who's considering doing a PGCA anybody who's already signed up for the PGCA because that's the point actually I actually got enrolled on my course for the PGCA in March the year before but I began the application of around Christmas time so I went for an interview at a different university before I got the University of Chester which is where I went but I know of people who actually only signed up in the summer holidays and actually I know of someone who actually even signed up in September so it's not even too late if you're watching this video now ish well I'm filming this at the beginning of August but I feel like you know well just yeah, use your own initiative. If you're unsure, just call up the university. I've got a cup of coffee. The temperature is kind of like optimum, but it only stays optimum for a short amount of time. So I may have to just pause recording whilst I just appreciate the optimum temperature of my coffee. I'm sure that you'll understand. I say optimum, it may be like a few degrees below optimum. So the application process, as you will have all completed a BA honours, you will understand the application process on UCAS and it's the exact same. You just apply through UCAS. To be honest, I can't even remember doing it, which means it must have been straightforward. <laughs> um, unless my mum did it. Could be a possibility. You never know. <laughs> no, I'm pretty sure I did it. <laughs> I don't actually think I did. I can't remember. So yeah, it's the same as applying on UCAS. You just select the universities in order of preference. Is it in order of preference? I think it is. You'll know, you'll know. Just basically go on UCAS, you apply through UCAS and then obviously the university will contact you if you if they would like an interview with you. Each university is different as well, obviously. I just want to highlight that now. Obviously, I can only base this video and the information on my own experience, which was at the University of Chester, but obviously different universities have a whole different layout of the course and may do things differently. But the overall experience and the overall consensus is generally the same between universities. At the end of the day, they're all working towards the same qualification so I expect that they're all virtually the same but just with a few differences. In fact, I met other students from different universities who were also doing the PGCE and I compared and there were a few differences but nothing major. So in terms of the application process, my personal experience, I was very optimistic, I would say, and I applied for Oxford and Cambridge and Brighton. And I remember putting Brighton because I just thought I don't actually want to go there, but I'm just going to put it because you have to get you have to give three choices. So I really wanted Oxford or Cambridge and then 
I just felt because I have to do another one I just put Brighton because I think it's a really nice place but yeah realistically I wanted Oxford or Cambridge within a day Oxford invited me for an interview so I was like wow oh my gosh like yay and I think the day after Oxford invited me for an interview, Cambridge said no. So I was like, okay then, I'm going to Oxford anyway. So I went for the interview and everything. They basically just asked about my experience teaching, if I'd had any experience teaching and, you know, why I want to get into teaching. Just the questions that you can imagine that they would ask. There was nothing unusual. There have been stories of unusual questions being asked at Oxford interviews. So I was a bit like, oh, what are they going to ask me? To be honest, I think I would have responded better to the weird questions. Wasn't there an interview when the interviewer threw a bag at a candidate and said, imagine it's a bomb. And then they threw it out the window. And then they were like, yes, we'll have you at our university because you can think on your feet. But yeah, they didn't do that. So I was a bit disappointed because I was preparing for that. I was doing lots of practicing at home. That might explain why I didn't go to Oxford in the end. Their loss. Brighton also offered me an interview, but I was like, mm, just too far away from where I live. So then I was like, mm, no. Had a rethink and then was like, okay, I want to go to Chester, University of Chester, which is where I did my undergraduate. So I basically like scrapped that whole application and then you can apply by each university individually. So I just went for Chester. They gave me an interview, went to the interview and it was a very different interview process to Oxford, which is interesting actually, because you kind of expect that they're all going to be the same or very similar. So it was just me there at the interview, whereas at Oxford there was another candidate, but they did say that it was unusual for there just to be the two of us because a few others had dropped out. Uh, but at Chester, it was just me. I think that they said another candidate that had dropped out as well actually so that seems to be a recurring theme anyway it was very very intense because we did the whole interview in French which wasn't what was supposed to happen so I was a bit like oh my gosh but anyway it was really good because I did the interview let me think the exact process so I had to do a presentation I think I did it in French could have done it in Spanish I can't remember it had to be about a topic in the curriculum, in the MFL curriculum. So I did it about festivals. I did Les Fées de Bayon. Yeah, so that was in French. And then she asked me questions about my presentation. And then we did the rest of the interview in French. So it was, you know, tell me about your experience teaching and things like that. <laughs> Parlez-moi au sujet de l'enseignement et vos expériences. Yeah, went a bit like that. And then we had to do a written part of the interview where she gave me like four different questions to do with education And then I had to write like a big essay about it So she went off but before I even had chance to start writing my essay She came back in and she was like I've just spoken to the head of the course He's here now he would like to just ask you a few questions So he asked me some questions like about languages and teaching and everything And then they were like yeah we'd just like to offer you the place now So I was like wow great so I don't have to write this essay And she was like no no we want to off you the place but I was like you know what I wanted to write this essay because that's just the type of person I am tee -hee. so yeah they offered me the place right there and then so I was like yeah thanks cool I'll take it <laughs> she's really nice actually it was much more laid back at Chester it was much more down to earth at Chester so basically you have your interview with your subject specialist and then on that occasion the head of the course came in and basically just check that I was you know appropriate for the course and then that was it the only one thing which they said during the interview is that this may be different depends on the university but generally from the people who I've spoken to from different universities it seems to be universal they want you to do at least five days in a high school and I say at least because I know of some people who had to do two weeks and I know of some people who had to do 10 days or more or a month so as far as I know, our university was the minimum from what I've heard. So we had to do five days in a high school, even if you have had experience teaching in a high school before, even if you've done teaching in a primary school, because I did the language assistantship. So I worked as an English language assistant in a primary school in Spain for a year. So obviously I had 
a year's experience of teaching essentially from that but they wanted another five days specifically in a high school and recently before starting the course we just had to get that done before starting the course in September so obviously that meant that we had to just basically get it done before the summer holidays because we started in September considering that I got my offer of the PGC place in March I tried to find a school that would let me just do my five days at their school from March virtually until July when they finished for summer and I struggled to find a school that would let me do that. You would have thought and I thought that a school would appreciate the help because obviously at that point I hadn't yet graduated but I'd finished my degree so I could speak French and Spanish at that point already and I was asking schools if they would basically let me come to help them and they were all saying no so if you're in that position now I would definitely recommend that you start sooner rather than later and to be honest I can't even recommend like, a specific thing to say because it just seems that I don't know maybe for them they think that it's unnecessary work I can kind of see why it's easy to just say no because otherwise you have to arrange for somebody to meet the person and take them to each interview individual class but because I knew that I would just get on with it and not be a hassle to them I didn't really understand why everybody was saying no. On reflection I can kind of understand why in that situation and many situations similar to that in life why it may be easier for them to just say no and save themselves a the hassle. So yeah if you're in that position I'd definitely start sooner than later and as well as emailing I reckon that maybe call them as well because then you can really express your passion for education and how you will help definitely get involved and like walk around and help because obviously then it's just helpful for the teacher they're doing you a favor you're doing them a favor and also it may be helpful further down the line if you need another placement then you've already formed that bond that relationship with them they know who you are maybe you can contact them in the future to ask if you could do your placement now so before our course started we had an induction day in july so they sent us all a letter and said to come in on this day it was just going to be an introduction to the course but not all of us turned well not all of everybody on the course turned up i did and to be honest it just made me scared for the course i remember they drew a gra th this is basically all i remember they drew a graph on the board and they were like you're not just going to go like from zero and then you know gradually get better like in a straight line you can have ups downs and then like linear moments is that what's called where you just kind of plateau and then you're gonna go up and down and then at the end you'll be great hopefully so yeah that's all I remember from it but um I remember feeling like I had to go but evidently not everybody turned up so if you do have an induction day just bear in mind that it's probably not going to affect you too much if you don't go because bear in mind that I went and still didn't really know what was going on for the majority of the year it evidently shows that it wasn't really that beneficial for me personally and to be honest I say I didn't really know what was going on for the rest of the year. I'm speaking on behalf of everybody on the course or everybody who I spoke to because I don't know of one person who seemed to understand what was going on that year. So that's why I'm filming this video for you. So you will be the person who knows what's going on and everybody can come to you for advice and be like, hey, Julie, what's going on? And you can be like, huh, well, I watched this YouTube video. So <laughs> listen, blah, 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 blah. So when the course actually started in September, we started with university days. So we spent, I think, three weeks at university before going to our placements. I know that different universities spend different amounts of time at university. I know Bangor University spent more time at university at the beginning and then they just had solid chunks of placement at school whereas we had two three weeks i think at university and then we had the friday of every week in university during the first placement so yeah kind of like weighs up but then Bangor university didn't have half term they literally didn't have half term so when the school was on half term and like you know you're supposed to get your half term holiday like a week off they went to uni for that full week so that meant that in summer they finished earlier but me personally 
I don't think that I could have handled that because it's very, very intense. The course is so intense. So just having that week off, I say week off, it was a week to kind of catch up. It, like I worked every single day of every half term of every like Christmas, Easter, weekend, night. Honestly, it was constant. Maybe you could bear that in mind when you're looking for different universities to go to because obviously it's unique. The layout of the course is unique to the university, so maybe have a way up of which one would work best for you. In terms of placement, I literally had no idea how it worked, and I just kind of had the mindset that I was going to trust the university, trust them with it all. At the beginning of the course, they asked us for information, including our address, whether we have a car, whether we have children. I think that was it whether we have any dependables, which could be children or like if you're a carer, I think. So that was all taken into account. We were told that our placements would be based on this information. So I just basically kind of assumed that because I didn't have a car and that I was living in Chester city center because I'd given them my specific address, I just assumed that my placement would be relatively nearby and either in walking distance or commutable on a bus or train or whatever, but nothing, you know, too far away because obviously I didn't have a car. Before the course started, I was a bit concerned about the placement because my sister did primary education. So she did three years of teaching and so she'd had experience of the placement procedure. And because she lived back home and she did hers through Manchester University, it worked differently so she could recommend schools. So bearing this in mind, I began to look for schools around where I was living and began to contact them. And I also contacted the university and asked them how it's supposed to work and if I'm supposed to source my own placement. I began to do that before the course started. I think I contacted the university like on the second day of our course starting and said, I still haven't found my own placement. Like, should I be worried? Like, what, how is it gonna be determined? How, like, do you find it or what? Like, I had no idea. They hadn't really said at university, <laughs> during the lecture or like the lead of the course was like do not contact schools directly because we've had somebody contact us and say that they contacted every school in the area and none of them have got back to her and I was like oh my god that's me that's literally about me so that taught me my lesson and from then on I was like okay I'm supposed to leave it to them okay cool I trusted them I was like I've given them all my information they know I don't have a car they know my situation, they'll find me a good placement, don't have to worry. And then the placements got announced and my placement was very far away that you definitely needed a car to get there. So huh, straight away, oh my God, in fact, they gave me my placement and like I checked it all out and it was quite far away on public transport. This was my original placement, but I was kind of like, just gonna have to go with it. They told us that if your first placement is very far away, your second one is more likely to be nearby and vice versa. So I was like, okay, this is my far away placement. Next one will be nearby. So, okay, I'll just... I'll just get this one out of the way, then I'll have one nearby, so it's fine. But then the next day I got another email and they changed my placement to Wales. So to a different country. I was commuting to a foreign country. I was a foreigner in my con in <laughs> I was a foreigner in the school. Whoa, that is weird actually, isn't it? Was I a foreigner? Yeah, it was, because it's a different country. Wowzers. <laughs> so then I was put in a very difficult position because I looked at public transport and there wasn't good public transport so it would have taken me like two and a half hours to get there through like different buses and everything like that so I was in a very difficult position and so I went through the official procedure to try to get a different placement and they rejected my application I went to speak to my personal academic tutor and she said actually she was a lifesaver because she said that there were other students also going to the same school so hopefully one of them could give me a lift from Chester City Centre because obviously lots of people doing the course at Chester University live in Chester so I was so lucky she got me in contact with a girl who was also going there who we've become good friends now so I went with her every day just paid her petrol money and it was just the best setup ever so I was very lucky to have found a girl who lived in the same area and who was going to the exact same school every day. So yeah, I was just so, so lucky. I wasn't as lucky during my second placement. In my mind, because, because the university had said, 
that if our first placement was far away, our second one was more likely to be nearby. I was just very optimistic about the second placement and just hoped that it was in walking distance. That was how optimistic I was. Then it got announced and it was way further than my first placement like ridiculously far away not even like geographically far away but it was just extremely hard to get to because of the transport it would have just taken so long it was literally like a half an hour walk to the train station and then maybe 20 minutes on the train and then another 45 minutes walk on the other side and bearing in mind you have to carry a lot of books and folders and um, materials on a daily basis it just wasn't really manageable added to the fact that the train would have cost about 450 pounds per month on top of my rent and bills which I was paying the whole reason I was paying to live in Chester was so that I didn't have to commute so to then have to pay rent and the cost of commuting it just kind of defeated the point of living in Chester so I again went through the official appeal and again it got rejected so I began to look for an alternative placement and I ended up moving home and getting a placement nearby to where I live at home. Based on both of my placements on reflection if I were to do it again I think I would have basically ignored what the lead of the course said to not contact schools directly and I would have 100% done that if I'd have known the placements that I was given. I mean during the first placement I was extremely lucky to have found the girl who was also going there and be able to share the car journey with her but that was just luck that she was going there as well obviously the university didn't arrange that and didn't know didn't anticipate that that was going to happen so really yeah on reflection I would have maybe as soon as I knew that I was going to do the course I would have started looking for placements if you live in an area where there is good transport like London or Manchester city centre or I don't know I don't know the exact places but all I know is that Chester doesn't really have that good transport in and out of Chester so I don't know maybe I should have anticipated that beforehand and of course it's near to Manchester University is near to Bangor University so obviously all of these universities are in competition for all the schools in the area the same schools in the area so it's a bit of a difficult one but yeah definitely on reflection knowing what I know now I would have tried to source both of my placements as soon as possible instead of just trusting in the university naively also I trusted them that they did it fairly based on if you got a further away placement first placement you'll get somewhere nearby second placement and that obviously didn't happen so that was a bit upsetting uh, when I found out my second placement because I just trusted what they said I trusted that they were telling the truth and they weren't so definitely bear that in mind <laughs> another thing during the course we were all very confused about how our final grading worked as the course got nearer to the end we were more and more confused about how our final grade was going to be determined we didn't know if it was based on our folder work if it was based on what our subject mentor at the school thought or on our evaluations or what our university mentor thought when they came to visit us if it was based on what they thought of like the whole experience or just our final lesson observation nobody really knew and depending on who you asked they all said different things and basically some of the lecturers actually said that they didn't know your subject mentor at your school plays a big part in your university experience and basically your final grade so they give you a lesson evaluation at least once a week so they grade you in each standard so you have eight standards and they give you like beginning developing good outstanding good is the minimum that you need to qualify as an NQT a newly qualified teacher and outstanding obviously is the level up so your subject mentor will give you a lesson evaluation each week then your university mentor will come in to give you another lesson observation throughout the year Year. it depends on the amount that they do it so for me she only came twice but that's a very very small amount I know some people who had their university mentor come in multiple times per term I feel like generally they're most likely to come in maybe four times throughout the year so twice during each placement yeah and I initially used to get very nervous when my uni mentor was coming in because I felt like there was so much pressure because although you're teaching every single day, they're coming in to watch you for one hour and obviously 
during the hour anything can happen and it's natural for some lessons to go really well and some lessons to not be the best so you're just hoping and praying that this one hour goes outstandingly well so that you get the best grade that you can but obviously that doesn't always happen especially when you're working with unpredictable students who are you know varying ages and abilities but I later found out that really your subject mentor from uni, your uni mentor is essentially coming in to check that your school subject mentor is grading you properly because your subject mentor at school is giving you gradings each week and your uni mentor comes in essentially to make sure that they agree with their feedback and their gradings during the hour. They use that as like a way to compare and to just make sure that there's consistency throughout the course. So they're just going to check everybody to make sure there's consistency. So when I noticed that, it kind of took the pressure off me because it is a lot of pressure to feel like that one hour is the be all and end all, especially if like in my case, they only come in twice during the entire year. It's not very much. If you think about an entire year, the amount of days you're teaching and they're coming in to see one hour of a lesson. So like I said, you get your lesson evaluation one per week at least. And then the idea is that that goes in your folder as evidence and then at the end of the year, so when you're getting your final grading with your university mentor, they look at your folder as evidence and they check back throughout the year to see where your, your, to see where your subject mentor graded you in each standard and then that basically accumulates to help them give you your final grade. So yeah, so basically you just put your evidence in the folder, not even just from lesson observations, any evidence to show each standard. So standard eight is how you contribute to wider life, wider professional life in the school. I can't remember what it's called off the top of my head specifically, but it's about wider professional life. So for example, going on school trips, doing parents evening, doing break and lunchtime duties, bus duties. So just get evidence of those things. So for example, you could ask another member of staff who you do the bus duty with to just make a note to say, I can confirm that Victoria did bus duty from the 1st of February until July the 2nd signed teacher. Put that in your evidence folder and that proves essentially that you did bus time duty which contributes to standard eight and contributes to your grade in standard eight and your overall grade. So you need outstanding in at least six standards to get outstanding overall and then most people just get good which is still what you need to pass. Yeah you need good in all standards to pass. So your subject mentor, professional mentor and uni mentor are all very important throughout the year. So at each placement, you will get a subject mentor and a professional mentor. In most cases, they are different, but in some schools, your professional mentor will also be your subject mentor, which it doesn't have to be an issue, you know, but they play a very important role in the whole process because like I said, they give you a lesson evaluation each week. Also, in some schools, your professional mentor will give you a lesson evaluation throughout the course of the placement. So at my first placement, my professional mentor gave me, I think, two lesson evaluations. But on my second placement, my professional mentor didn't give me any official lesson observations. However, she did observe me in one lesson and gave me verbal feedback, which was fine by me. Depending on the school, the professional mentor seems to have varying levels of responsibility. I mean, I guess not responsibility, but input in your experience. So at my first placement, my professional mentor, she was very much there. We saw her every day. She was always giving us advice. They give you basically lectures as well whilst you're at school. So I saw her on a daily basis. Whereas at my second placement, I didn't see my professional mentor half as much, but we still got those lessons once a week. So yeah, essentially the role of the professional mentor is somebody that you can go to for help, advice, and they give you lectures about education and learning and learning methods and things like that and then your subject mentor is subject specific obviously and one of the last things I want to talk about is the importance of the evidence folder itself because hmm 
It's a very important thing, as you can imagine, because like I said, that is what is judged at the end of the course. And obviously, if you don't have very good evidence, then it's going to be hard to get a good grade. Whereas if you've got loads of evidence, then it's easy to show how you have achieved a very good grade in each standard. So the whole fault is very important. The idea of it is that you put your evidence in there from the beginning of the course to the end to show your progress and to show evidence continually throughout the two placements. In my experience, I had no clear idea of how it should be set out. We were never told we want it like this, we want it like that. We were actually told by the head of the course that you set it out however you want it, it's your personal journey file. And it was the same at my sister's university. One of the lecturers told her that it's up to you how you do it, it's your own personal progress, so it's your own personal way of doing it, it's up to you. I asked for advice from my professional mentor in the school during my first placement and I showed her my folder and how I'd set it out and she was happy with that and said that it was fine so I continued to do it like that and the way how I did it was for example if I got a piece of evidence that was relevant to maybe three different standards I just put the piece of evidence in my folder and with a post-it note I wrote for example standard four standard five standard six and then wrote how it was each standard and then just put that post-it note on as opposed to separating each standard and then consequently putting that same piece of evidence in three times into the relevant standard because that would mean that I would need to photocopy it three times and as in the end I had I think five folders no four maybe I had four or five folders in the end so if I'd have had to photocopy everything up to three times and I would have had three times the amount which just wasn't really normal so that worked for me the way how I did it worked for me people do it differently but that's the way how I did it and that's the way how my professional mentor at my first placement said was fine so I continued to do that throughout the whole of the two placements and what's supposed to happen when your subject mentor from university comes in to visit you is that they are supposed to have a look at your folders to make sure that you're doing it correctly to make sure that you're lesson evaluations are all up to date, your weekly reviews are up to date, I mean each university does it different and yeah, yeah just to check it but my subject mentor said that she trusted me so she didn't check it which was fine by me because I was confident with what I was doing, I was like yeah I'm, I'm confident, I'm doing it fine. Essentially I was putting in all of the information that I needed to. She asked me have you done your weekly reviews? Yes. Have you done your lesson evaluations every week? Yes. Have you been getting your lesson observations every week? Yes. Uh, have you been putting the lesson plan pro formas in every day? Yes. So I was doing everything. Have you been putting evidence of like marking and and I was like yes and I've done um, parents evening, I've done bus duty, I've got a year eight form and then I had a year 12 form. I go to assemblies, I go to all of the meetings, I go to the subject meetings after school, I go to the whole school meetings, I go to the year group specific ones to do with the form, I do PSHE. So she was like right fine that's great, I can tell that you've got it all under control. So I was like great cool. So she never looked at my folder until the very last day of the course which was not a good idea because on the last day she said show me evidence for standard one and I was like oh I didn't organize it into standards I did what I've just explained I've got one piece of evidence and then it applies to different standards and I've made that clear on each piece of evidence and she said I didn't want it like that I wanted it in each standard and that was the very very first time that I'd heard that and if I'd have known that, I would have done that. But I had never been told that. So that was annoying, but I explained how I set it out. In the end, she said, okay, then that's fine. That works, we'll do it that way. But I have to be honest, throughout the meeting, like the, it was an hour to like determine our final grade. It was NQT transition interview. Throughout that time, she kept on saying, okay, show me evidence for standard four, show me evidence for standard 5A. And I was, I, I don't know, I found it very stressful because as I hadn't put them in order like that, it was very difficult for me to find specific evidence for specific standards and specific substandards. Bearing in mind, I had five different folders and I knew that time was of the essence. She kept on saying, oh, we've not got long, we've not got long. And I kept on trying to find the specific evidence and, as she wanted it 
in, in that way she was asking for it at a relatively quick pace and I hadn't prepared for it to be shown in that way I just prepared I had prepared for her to look through each piece but as it was they don't look at everything she just wanted an example of this an example of that which if I'd have known that then I would have set it out accordingly but I'd never been told that so one of my biggest points of advice would be to ask at the very beginning of the course to ask the person who will be doing your final NQT transition interview and ask them how they would like your folder set out. They may say that they want it in different standards. They may say it's completely up to you. They may say that they want it chronologically but then you know and then you can do it exactly how they want it so you're not in the position that I was in where I was like what? So yeah that was that would be a piece of advice I definitely recommend you take. And then in terms of jobs some people got their NQT placement, NQT yeah yeah their job basically as a newly qualified teacher they got it fairly early on. I think I remember somebody getting it during the first half term so like October time or November time yeah, November, like the beginning of November, even though we started in September, some people got it around Christmas. It was just like continually through the year. And then there is a time period where a lot of jobs come up because it's the last kind of time set when teachers can hand in their notice before the summer holidays to like not start back in September. And I think that's around like April, May time. And then there are still jobs in June and July. And then they tend to die down and there aren't really any over summer, but I'm guessing that in September they'll all start pouring back in again when people return and they're like, ooh, I want to hand in my notice. <laughs> so in terms of jobs, you just basically have to go for interviews around your time in the placement, which is fine, but it can sometimes be a bit difficult in terms of planning for an interview and planning your normal lessons as well. So that's something to bear in mind. And generally the whole PGC experience is very very intense as I'm sure you have already heard because everybody loves telling you how difficult it is and how you're never going to have a social life ever again, how you'll never experience having free time again which to be honest like I definitely definitely experience it's very intense, it's very draining and time consuming and it's sometimes difficult but I feel like because of the holidays there's always something to aim for because during the half term and the holidays you can use that time to kind of catch up with work and maybe have like a few lions as well well to be honest you need those lions like especially if your placement's far away and you have to get up at like the crack of dawn to get there and then you get home dead late as well which I feel like is most people on my course <laughs> so yeah I would recommend starting to look for a placement ASAP if you haven't already done so, so that you just don't have to travel like a million miles to get there. <laughs> the whole experience was very fun. I've met some great friends who also did the course and it was really good actually to have friends from the course who are at your placement because then during break time and lunch time you can like they're just like a support and you can like ask for advice about things and share information and share experiences and give advice and laugh and cry and <laughs> yeah it's just really great but it is difficult as well to explain to people who haven't done the course how intense it is. So I think it's very important to have a kind of like a support network of people who are actually doing the course at the same time. So you're kind of going through it all together because it is very hard to explain to somebody who's not doing the course how intense it is because it's just very much a lot of lesson planning, marking, um, essays on top of it and assignments and yeah but I hope that this video has given you an insight into it and it's given you some advice on what to expect because I didn't really know what to expect so yeah and now I am sharing with you my knowledge from my experience if you do have any specific questions about it then you can comment them down below I definitely will respond to you I don't know if there's anything else to say really in fact actually <laughs> I will say something so this video was basically my overview of what to expect it's an informative video and I have actually filmed and edited and uploaded but haven't set it as live yet a video 
about my own personal experience and it's very very in depth and personal to my entire time during the PGCA and I won't be uploading that until a little bit of time has passed you can look out for that um to be honest <laughs> it might not be going up until November which is a very see uh, to be honest I was gonna say it seems a long yeah it is a long time away I was gonna say it seems a long time away but it's not but no it is <laughs> so that will be going up as well but at the same time if you have any specific questions then comment them down below and I will respond and let you know to the best of my knowledge so yes I hope that you've enjoyed this video uh, let me know if you are about to do a PGC if so what subject primary secondary let me know what are you looking forward to most what are you most not looking forward to yeah i hope that you enjoyed this video everybody if you're not doing a pgc and you just thought that you'd watch this for the bands then wow you are an amazing person and i really admire your intellectual abilities yeah i just came to my mind so anyway yeah yeah i hope that you enjoyed the video like subscribe if you want to if you liked it you know, you never know, you might want to, I might have just reminded you, you might be like, oh yeah, actually, I will like this video, or you might be like, oh my god, everyone says that, shut up, if I wanted to like the video, I would have already liked it, and in fact, because you said that now, I'm not going to like it, so yeah, it's completely up to you, but you know, like, I'd really appreciate it if you did like it, and if you did subscribe, and if you did comment down below, like, I love reading your comments, I love, yeah, <laughs> so yeah hope yeah i'm gonna go now so yeah like i said a billion times hope that you enjoyed the video like subscribe comment down below and bye everybody now i am sharing with you my knowledge from my experience if you do have any specific questions about it then you can comment them down below i definitely will respond to you i don't know if there's anything else to say really in fact actually <laughs> i will say something so this